Thanks for inviting us here, and thanks to everyone for uh, coming to, to see this presentation. Uh, as Robert said, uh, YDTI on the title. Uh, it's not the Berkeley Pitt talk. <coughs> this is about the Yankee Doodle tailings impoundment. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah. Okay, introductions. Just I'm going to give some brief <coughs> introductions of who I am and uh, who Dan is, and then uh, Dan's going to take over and provide the, the bulk of the presentation today. So, next slide. Yeah, it's just a point out this is a view of the Yankee Doodle Tailings impoundment from uh, Moulton Road effectively from the West Ridge there, looking down on some of the active construction over the last uh, couple of years. And you can see the, the supernatant pond, uh, the, or the, the water pond that's in the back, and then there's about a mile long tailings beach from there to the, the front side of the facility uh, where you see the dam kind of in town. Okay, as Robert said, uh, I'm Ken Brower. Um, I'm, uh, I've been working uh, as a professional engineer in Montana for the mining industry for, well, since about 1985. Um, I was talking to Dave earlier and we talked about Montana Tunnels. That's uh, one of the projects that I was first involved with. I've been involved uh, with a number of the other projects here and I've been coming back and forth to Montana Resources for about 20 years, although it's only in the, the last uh, seven or eight years that I've had a very active involvement and uh, officially became the engineer of record as defined in the new legislation uh, about five, five years ago, four years four. ago, yeah. Uh, Dan has been working together with me for almost 15 years now. Uh, he is the uh, specialist geotechnical engineer for the project. He's really the geotechnical manager or the engineering manager of all of the uh, technical aspects of the project. Uh, driving through uh, various initiatives and working, both of us work closely with uh, Montana Resources, uh, Mark and his team in uh, making these things happen so that we can continuously improve the facility. Uh, and of course, Dan and I are supported by a, a whole Night Peace Old team. Uh, we've got a, a whole crew of people that are involved in the project doing various aspects uh, of uh, the work. Um, including, you know, we've got civil engineers, geoscientists, uh, geotechnical engineers, hydrogeologists, uh, and mechanical engineers to look at the water management systems, et cetera, as well. With that, I think I'm going to pass over to Dan, and he can go through the outline and the rest of the subject matter. Thanks a lot, Ken, and uh, uh, thanks to Robert for inviting us here today. Um, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all. And, explain a bit of the work that uh, has gone on over the last few years and, and uh, continues um, you know, each year, uh, even while some of the, the uh, permitting aspects are, are going on in the background. So we'll touch a little bit on the amendment application process and really a couple points in the, in the new legislation that came out in 2015 and, and um, uh, why we're here and who else is involved uh, as a result of that. Talk a little bit about the content of the design document, uh, uh, which is kind of the precursor for the uh, for the EIS and contains most of the technical matter as relates to to the design and, and ongoing uh, operation of, of the facility. And then we'll touch on on two other aspects, and, and those are operational improvements that have been implemented over the last couple of years uh, in collaboration with Montana Resources, as well as some of the instrumentation and monitoring that we do on the impoundment uh, uh, each year and some of the, the, the reporting that we do. Uh, here's a shot of uh, the Tailings Beach again. This is kind of from the east side of the impoundment uh, near Rampart Mountain. And we're just looking out over some uh, fairly fresh tailings uh, that were deposited in the last uh, year or so as a result of uh, a change to the tailings distribution system, which we'll touch on a little bit later. But it's really developing this nice, nice long beach and, and pushing the pond kind of the back of the facility up against the, uh, 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 the northern side topography. So back in, uh, in 2015, um, uh, some new legislation was introduced in Montana uh, that, that now governs the, uh, the design and effectively operation of tailings management facilities uh, in, in the state. And Mark, uh, Mark Thompson was one of the lead people in developing this legislation in conjunction with a lot of the mine operators and, and, the, and the state government. Um, and in, on May 4th, uh, uh, that was, I guess, signed into place. And, it, and there are three aspects of that that we're going to touch on today. There's, it's, it's a very big piece of legislation. 
But there are three aspects of that that we're going to talk about that really uh, apply to the work that was done over the last several years. The first was it introduced a requirement to have an engineer of record for the facility. Second was it introduced um, the content or the required content for something called a design document, which uh, would would be required uh, for a, a new facility or an expansion or change to an existing facility. And then it introduced the requirement for um, uh, something called an independent review panel, which is a best practice around the world um, uh, for facilities. And, and we're going to dive into um, their roles uh, in a bit more detail here in the next couple of slides. Um, so the engineer record, uh, Ken, as it, as it were, um, uh, has certain recent legislative responsibilities uh, within, the, within the state as it relates to the facility. Uh, the first is all the designs and documents that are produced that relate to that. He needs to review and he needs to seal them, uh, put his professional engineer stamp on it and sign it if it's going to the state. Um, every year, at least every uh, once a year, he comes out and does an annual inspection uh, and there's a report that gets written as a result of that annual inspection that if it contains recommendations are effectively binding recommendations that have to be addressed. Um, and a corrective action plan and, and schedule needs to be prepared to implement those recommendations. And then, uh, you know, of, of utmost importance is he's responsible to notify the operator and the government if there is any, uh, if the facility is not performing as intended and if there's evidence that it um, uh, presents an imminent threat. Um, so as a as Ken mentioned, in 2015, he officially became the engineer of record for the impoundment, but our, his involvement had grown uh, from about 2012 uh, through 2015 to be fairly regular, and that was kind of the period where uh, he was evaluating whether he would take on that, that role uh, and, and, and uh, yeah, sit in that role for Montana Resources. Um, talk a little bit about this. One key aspect of the engineer of record is that he, he can't be, a, uh, can't be a, an employee of the operator of the facility. Uh, he has to be independent of them. Uh, so the design document uh, requirements are laid out in, in some great detail, and I've kind of shortened it up here f for us all, but there's a number of things that, that you're required to show in that document that's ultimately, ultimately going to be reviewed by an independent panel who decide whether you've met the requirements of the legislation. So that design document needs to include a detailed description of it and design criteria. You need to evaluate alternatives uh, to uh, either creating that new impoundment or, ex or uh, continuing to use or expanding, changing the impoundment. You also have to do a, a, an appropriate amount of geotechnical investigation and characterization of the site, followed by some uh, an assessment of the, st the stability of the embankment uh, or the impoundment uh, risk assessment. Um, including seismic evaluations of the facility. Uh, and then you need to look at water management and uh, something called quantitative performance parameters, but things you can measure easily in the field to tell if it's, if it's operating as intended. And you need to develop a, a plan for construction management. Then there's uh, the, the legislation introduced a need for an independent review panel, which consists of three independent review engineers that are specialists in their field. Um, uh, they, need, they can be selected by the applicant, but ultimately, or the operator, but ultimately they need to be approved by the DEQ. Uh, and they can't be an employee of the, of the operator uh, or the design consultant or an employee of the EOR. Uh, so they have to be truly independent of, of those two groups. Uh, and, and they effectively represent um, uh, the public and the DEQ in technical matters related to uh, tailing storage facilities, the design thereof monitoring and ultimately uh, closure. Um, there are a number of people that are allowed to p participate in that panel. Uh, the engineer of record is a participatory member. He attends all the meetings the IRP has and presents to them. However, he is not a member of the panel per se. And then uh, the DQ is allowed to have a representative of the panel or, or more than one in, in, in many cases. Um, or uh, who observe the panel meetings, and then the, the operator, or, or Mark, is often in attendance of those meetings as well, always in attendance of those meetings. And their role is, as I mentioned, to review the design document, document for consistency with the legislation and write a report that says this either meets the requirements of legislation or does not. And if it does not, uh, here, here, is, here are some recommendations, here, here are the things you need to change. 
and then the engineer record is required by the legislation to make those changes, submit new versions uh, in order to gain approval. And their determination is conclusive. Is conclusive. They are kind of the be-all, end-all of whether it, whether it uh, uh, fits the ticket, shall we say. So for, for, the, for the Yankee Deal Tailings Empowerment, there are, there are three independent review panel members uh, that have been involved since 2015. Uh, we involved them fairly early on in the process. You really only need them officially to review the design document. We got them involved during the preparation of the design document and met with them a number of times um, in order to kind of help us drive and decide what the content would be and, and uh, how to uh, uh, meet the requirements uh, fully of this new legislation. So it was kind of a, a learning process. It was the first time it had been really been applied. Um, uh, you know, uh, anyways, so uh, the three members are, are, they were chosen for their particular specialties. Dr. Leslie Smith is a professional geologist, uh, hydrogeological specialist. He's a professor out of UBC, uh, University of British Columbia in Canada. Uh, and he, he travels worldwide, serving in this sort of role on a number of independent review panels for, for different mining projects. Uh, he was selected because of the uh, regional interest in groundwater in, in Butte as it relates to Superfund, as well as the uh, particular interest of, or the particular uh, requirements of assessing hydrogeological conditions along the West Ridge, um, which we'll touch on uh, in a minute. Uh, and then Jim Swaysgood and, and Dirk Van Ziel are both geotechnical specialists. Jim is a seismic hazard specialist and seismic deformation specialist. So we got him involved because of the, uh, the potential for high, high uh, uh, earthquake ground motions on the nearby Continental Fault and the Rocker Faults. Um, and then uh, and both of them were involved because of the, uh, the size of the impoundment, the size of the Rockville Dam that supports the impoundment and the long history. Jim, uh, interestingly, was involved in the initial construction of the impoundment uh, back in 1963. Um, uh, he did an evaluation uh, uh, there after they had constructed the, after Anaconda had constructed some of the original dikes. So uh, it was pretty interesting to kind of get him pulled in and hear some of his stories about, you know, the early days as they were. <coughs> I'll touch here again on a bit of the content of the design document or, or what the design document um, uh, and, and ultimately the amendment were about. So there are two primary objectives to the, to the permit amendment, and th that differs somewhat from the full content of the design document. Uh, the primary uh, purposes of the amendment were to raise the elevation of the, of the west embankment, and uh, I, I guess to, to give you some, uh, to spatially get you oriented, uh, you can typically see the, f the front end of the facility here uh, from, from town, from most places in town. Um, there's a, a north-south embankment which runs up towards the east ridge. Uh, there's what we call the east-west embankment which runs kind of from the center area there that you can see out towards uh, uh, the Moulton Road area. And then there's been, a, a, over the last couple of years as part of um, uh, the last amendment, there's been a, a west embankment constructed along uh, this side of the impoundment in order to uh, confine the, the tailings and supernatant pond to that side. And as part of that, there's a, uh, something called the West, the West Embankment Drain, which has been uh, under construction, uh, which ultimately will control groundwater elevations on this side of the facility. So the, the primary, I guess, the, the two main aspects of the permanent amendment is to build this dam 50 feet higher uh, so that it can be as high as the, uh, the dams are allowed to be over here. Uh, and then uh, to commission or to allow the, the pond to rise to a level where the west embankment drain is needed to control the hydrogeologic regime in that area. So here's a little mock-up of, of uh, that west embankment here. Uh, north is kind of the left of the screen, uh, south is to the right, uh, and Moulton Road would be just out of the screen here uh, running alongside. So there's a west embankment that's being constructed on the downslope side uh, towards the tailings impoundment. And in the base of that embankment uh, is, is a large aggregate drain, which runs uh, uh, by gravity all the way along the front side of that, and then comes through a topographic high here through a rock cut, and then drains out to a, to a, seepage, or a um, yeah, seepage collection pond over here. Um, here's a little cross section of it. I mean, this is a fairly large structure. It's 40 feet wide, about 10 feet deep, and it's made of really, really coarse, kind of one foot uh, diameter rock. 
uh, and then there's a bunch of uh, uh, lesser graded rock to create a uh, to prevent uh, material from washing into the voids there. Um, and this has a really enormous transmissive capacity. There's a lot of water that can flow in that uh, before it gets full. A uh, certain section of that, once you get through this rock cut here, is lined with, with uh, uh, a geomembrane, as is the pond where the water will ultimately be captured and then pumped back to the facility. Um, so the, the commissioning of this and the pump back of the water to the facility was, was one piece of uh, the amendment, and the other piece was raising this dam 50 feet uh, and, and ultimately um, raising the, the pond to the back uh, about 50 feet. So here's a little cross section of what's going on here. So we've got Molten Road over here, we've got the East Ridge, and groundwater generally flows down in this direction and, and into the impoundment. What we've done now is we've created a dam there and that groundwater still comes down and gets collected in this drain. And then the, the seepage coming through the impoundment, uh, through the tailings, uh, and in vertical seepage from the tailings, um, uh, kind of percolating down, gets collected in this drain and comes out. And that effectively keeps this, this groundwater elevation at the same, in the same condition that it is today. So water elevations rise over here and they don't rise over here effectively. So we always have groundwater pushing into the impoundment and we don't have water from the impoundment going the other way. Um, so those are the two main, main aspects of the permit amendment application, but because uh, of this new legislation we decided to uh, take a number of the uh, analyses and, and assessments that have been done in the past associated with the remainder of the impoundment and update those. And one of the things that we updated was the seismic hazard assessment. We hired a group out of, uh, out of California who, um, uh, a lady named Linda Alatique and a fellow named Nick Greger uh, out of Berkeley. Uh, and they're, they're, um, uh, some of their responsibilities have included effectively writing the codes that do that predict earthquake ground movements across the United States. So we hired them to do the assessment of the specific seismic hazard present in Butte and present for the Yankee Doodle Tailings impoundment uh, in order to update some of our analyses, some of our estimates of what how the impoundment might behave under under those uh, under earthquake conditions. Um, there's some numbers here, but effectively, that's uh, a pretty big earthquake. Um, uh, and, and as a result of uh, the size of this earthquake or the ground movement is really associated with uh, the, a movement along the continental fault, which there isn't a lot, much recent evidence that it has moved, uh, but is assumed to uh, have the potential to move as part of the design of the impoundment. <coughs> Any other earthquakes that are assessed are cons considerably smaller than that, that earthquake design ground motion. The other thing that we did is we assessed the flooding, uh, the flood criteria again. It had been done a number of times over the years, uh, and we updated that assessment uh, as part of the part of the application process. And so the, the design freeboard within the facility is is capable of storing something called a probable maximum flood. It's basically a the biggest biggest flood you could ever imagine, and probably twice that. Um, and really, what the to put it in perspective. Um, what that is, is that's something called the probable maximum precipitation, which is about 14 inches of rain. Uh, to put that in perspective, the, long, the mean annual precip for this area is about 16 inches. So it's basically a year of rain melting a 100-year snowpack, assuming that uh, the reservoirs upstream of the facility, the molten reservoirs, fail as well. So it's this enormous flood, and uh, the, the amount of storage in the, in the facility can hold that, um, in addition to uh, the operational needs of the impoundment. Uh, and then the other, the other thing that changed is, and this really affects the reclamation plan, is that um, uh, we, uh, we decided that for, for the purposes of long-term closure of the impoundment, that uh, uh, a, a closure spillway should be constructed such that, that uh, the water contained in the facility could never exceed a certain amount. The water is supposed to drop off. We're in a, a, a deficit condition in, in Butte, so uh, evaporation exceeds precipitation and the water volume <coughs> in the facility is expected to draw down into closure uh, and become a very small surface pond. But in order to, in the long-term context, make sure that, that that water could never uh, impound in there if climate conditions changed or, or what have you, um, this, this uh, reclamation post-closure spillway uh, would be constructed as an emergency 
um, uh, management feature. Touching a little bit on reclamation because it is a restoration class, we had to, we had to slip in a slide there somehow. Uh, th there's a couple things, a couple strategies uh, as part of kind of continuous improvement and uh, with an eye for some progress progressive reclamation where we are making changes to the design. Uh, there are a couple things that have been uh, implemented in that design. First one is that uh, the, the west embankment here uh, has flatter slopes around uh, three to one, three horizontal to one, or effectively a slope that can be uh, uh, reclaimed and, and planted um, progressively as the as the as the embankment rises. Uh, the other thing we've we've tried to do is, uh, and again we'll we'll talk about the tailings distribution system a little later, but we tried to improve uh, beach uniformity so that there's less regrading that needs to be done, um, while also driving the pond to the back of the facility here, uh, to the, uh, I guess the northeast side of the facility. And then uh, we're trying to promote a smaller pond so that there's more um, an upland, um, uh, upland area and, and planted grassy area. And then, uh, as we mentioned, the closure spillway for emergency management. So these are all aspects of the, uh, that by continuing operation, we're, we're able to um, uh, progressively improve reclamation potential at the site. So here's a, here's a big list of, design, of the documents that are contained in the design document. So we say a design document, but really it's 11 uh, very substantially sized reports that, uh, that were authored uh, and submitted for review by the independent review panel. And ultimately, uh, they commented on. Uh, at times, there were some updates, some minor updates. And then those were issued, uh, when accepted by the panel, those were issued uh, as part of the permit amendment application. Um, to the DEQ along with the approval letter from the, uh, from the independent review panel. As far as timelines go, um, uh, this, this process, uh, as I mentioned, started in early 2015 and the IRP was consulted throughout the process. Um, and ultimately the IRP final report came out in late 2017. So there's a, you know, there was about a two, two plus year period there where we were working on preparing the design document in conjunction with the panel and there were you know, a number of site visits. There was uh, several very large geotechnical, pro geotechnical and hydrogeological drilling programs that went on during that time. Uh, so in, in late 2017, we got the final report from the panel and uh, the permit amendment application was submitted and then there were the deficiency review comment periods with the DEQ and, and then finally the, a draft permit was issued and the EIS began and we're, I think we're getting to the to the end of that EIS process um, in uh, late Q, mid Q3, something like that, around August, September this year. Uh, but during that time, during that environmental application or amendment application environmental review period, there's still been ongoing work. You know, we, we're still uh, out here, um, you know, uh, every quarter, or every year, we're doing, still doing drilling programs in the summertime, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and then each year we're meeting with the independent review panel presenting uh, the findings from the last year, whether it's a drilling program or new instrumentation that's been installed, um, or uh, or results of uh, monitoring over the over the course of the past year, uh, we bring them to site, sit down with them for a couple of days, and, and present the results. And then, uh, uh, if they have any comments or suggestions, then uh, we can incorporate them into the next year's program. Here's just another view of the same thing. If, you know, effectively design document goes on, uh, IRP makes their review, and then it kicks into this, the the environmental permitting phase. But at the same time, you know, in parallel, we're we're going on and, and uh, continuing to operate the facility, continuing to monitor and progressively refine the operating practices and and, uh, and the uh, the monitoring protocols. I guess we'll uh, we'll roll into that. Um, Mark, I think you're coming up here in a minute. Get you on a slide. Uh, so there's a couple of a couple of um, uh, operational improvements and refinements that, that I want to, I guess, uh, describe here. Some some changes that we've made. Um, one of the, the first one here is that uh, this this uh, facility is incredibly interesting. I'm going to skip skip ahead a slide, and we're going to look at 2015. Uh, and this is just a, an over an aerial image of the facilities since 2015. So. In 2015, uh, you had this the, this fan-shaped um, uh, tailings uh, tailings beach. So this is the big tailings beach here. It's about a mile from here to here. This is the supernatant pond in the back, 
And for about 30 years, this facility, uh, the, the tailings beach in this facility was developed with a, effectively a single discharge point. There were tailings pipelines that went to here, and they shot out onto the beach, and the, um, the tailings stream would just windshield wiper back and forth across the beach and made this really long, mile-long tailings beach. Incredibly, incredibly, um, uh, uh, I'd say simple, uh, but very, very effective. Um, but as, as we began to develop uh, the need for the West Embankment here, um, there was, there's a desire to move the beach. We always wanted the Tailings Beach separating the pond from any embankment. Uh, and we have this drain that we don't want to just be sucking water into because it's directly adjacent to a pond. So in order to develop um, beach out, of, out in the far extents of the embankment that's similar in elevation to uh, the, the beach here, uh, we had to institute a, a change to the tailings distribution system. So in order to do that, uh, Montana Resources uh, built, a, built an additional pump station that's up on the, up on the dam. Uh, I think this is the, we call it booster station number three, but I think it's actually the fourth pump house. Um, and uh, uh, so we built that uh, booster station in order to be able to pump the tailings further. And um, laid out additional tailings lines. So now there's three tailings lines, and they run all the way out to the end of the west embankment and all the way out to the end of the north-south embankment. And there's, uh, I think this shows eight discharge points. There's actually a ninth one now that's up at the back of the facility. And that's used to shape the beach and improve uniformity. So we always want the beach to be slo sloping this way towards the pond, and we want to limit the number of low spots that are adjacent to the embankment. Um, so that's one, uh, one operational improvement that's been made uh, over the last several years. That went into effect in 2017. And we've seen um, you know, great, great gains in beach development over the last couple of years. Um, talked about that a little bit. Uh, the, other, the other one that we're really um, uh, happy with is, is some of the water inventory uh, reduction uh, measures that have gone on over the last few years. The first one started in, in 2016. Um, the mine uses uh, both pond water here as well as, as fresh water that's drawn from this, uh, the, the Silver Lake uh, water system uh, to support mining operations. Um, and, and historically, or in the last, uh, uh, within the last 10 years, um, some of that water had been used for, for dust management on the impoundment. And with the introduction of the multi-discharge uh, system, you could then achieve more, more even bet, uh, beach wetting by changing where you discharged. That provided an opportunity to reduce the draw on, on Silver Lake water and ultimately the amount of water that's, uh, that's brought into the facility. Um, the other one that's, that's uh, forthcoming uh, in, with much anticipation here is the, is the pilot uh, project for uh, treating Berkeley pit water. I don't know, Mark, whether you wanted to talk a little bit about um, about that specifically and, and where we're at? Now? Whenever you want, man. Okay. <laughs> no time like the present. Well, I was, I was at this seminar not too long ago and we talked about the um, pilot discharge project. And basically that was a project to pump a tree Berkeley pit. Um, yeah, it gets run around in circle on site for a while, but then ultimately discharge that water to Silver Boat Creek. And you know, as Dan, as Dan mentioned, Ken and Dan have had a recommendation to Montana Resources for a while to you know reduce the fresh water inventory that we held in the tailings impoundment. And uh, and here recently, um, you know, it's really kind of come to light to us why that's important. Um, you know, every every major every major dam facility. Every you know every high hazard dam has an inundation study, so it means there were a failure no matter for no, for no matter what reason what happens. And for many many years we were able to count on the Continental Pit and the Berkeley Pit um, to store anything any release from the tailings impoundment should you know something unexpected happen here. And 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 if you look at um, what drives inundation um, consequence is the amount of water and the, the amount of free water in the tailings power. So 
this project with the discharge, the pilot project, is we all, you know, like we talked about previously, we have this huge benefit. We're going to pump and treat Berkeley pit water. We're going to hold the Berkeley pit at its level that it is today. But we also can, we also have the ability to manage how much water is in the pond. In the past, you know, it's just kind of fluctuated. You know, we have dry years, it drops. We have wet years, it rises. We have dusty years. We were using Silver Lake water to control dust. Now we're using the tailings to do that. So um, now if we get a big storm event or a high big snowpack like we have right now come spring, we can use this system to maintain the water in the pond at a level that is no more than we absolutely need to operate. And that reduces the consequence. And as a, as a result of that reduced consequence, um, you know, we can, we can still maintain at that lower pond level, we can still maintain a breach on a property without release. Higher pond levels, yeah, it's a major facility, and, uh, and if something happens, it has major consequences. But we reduce those consequences by reducing that pond level. And, uh, you know, our partners in this project with, with ARCO, you know, every, you know, everybody understands that this is a really good thing, and, and this is what we're going to do. And, and this is on top of the benefits we get for the Berkeley pit and the, the Superfund site as well. So it's a really good project and, it, and it's uh, in large part been driven by the engineer record saying, hey, get yourself on a water diet and there's a good reason to do it. So. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. Give me a chance to breathe. Uh, I'll talk a little bit now about uh, some of the instrumentation and monitoring programs and how they've changed over the years. Um, ultimately, this, this is a big facility, and, um, and uh, so on a daily, hourly basis, we're taking measurements up there and looking at them and, and evaluating what's going on and looking for, for trends we don't like uh, and, um, thankfully, trends we like. Uh, uh, so. Uh, MR, MR themselves, uh, they have a, uh, we haven't talked about this here, but they have something called a Tailings Operation Maintenance and Surveillance Manual. And it's, it's another report and it lays out um, our plans, MR in conjunction with Night Peace Hold, uh, for monitoring the impoundment, surveilling the impoundment and, and maintaining it. Um, and and, and that's, that plan is applied effectively 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There are things that go on every day, every shift with the crews, they're checking in on things. That's part of that plan. Um, that plan also continuously evolves as, as new technologies become available to us, new software is developed, new state of practice standards are adopted. Uh, and there's really uh, four aspects of the, of the monitoring. Uh, first is, is the construction side monitoring. We're looking at what's being built. Uh, the second is the piezometric monitoring where we're looking at groundwater uh, pressures uh, within uh, the embankment, within the foundations, within the tailings, uh, within the, uh, uh, the around the edges of the impoundment to, to determine what's going on. We also monitor water. As Mark mentioned, we monitor all the various flows of water around the site so that we can understand um, if water is going up, water inventory is going up or water inventory is going down, why that is, um, and make predictions about how to make it go up and how to make it go down. Uh, and then we also monitor the development of the tailings beach and the pond and the uh, inventory within that pond and uh, the elevation of it. Uh, some, of the, some of the construction monitoring um, includes daily, weekly, and monthly reports that are prepared by people actually doing construction. So whether it's Montana Resources or whether it's a subcontractor doing earthworks or other, other work there, uh, they provide their, their own reports. Uh, there's also quarterly, like once every three months at least, uh, I'm typically out here doing, uh, doing a construction field review, uh, looking at construction practices, looking at uh, uh, ways we can improve that, talking with the engineering crew and the construction crews about, uh, about what, um, uh, what we do or what's coming up next, and then I provide a report on that. And then annually, at least annually, uh, uh, the engineer of record does a, uh, a construction inspection and provides his annual report, uh, which, which ha if it has the recommendations, as I mentioned, mentioned, is then a binding recommendation that Montana Resources has to prepare a corrective action plan that Ken thinks effectively deals with the recommendation. And then those reports go to the DETQ and go to the independent review panel so that they know uh, what's going on with the impoundment. 
Um, We've also, uh, there's also piezometric monitoring, so we're monitoring groundwater pressures and, and there's, there's been a lot of work since uh, 2015 to, to add um, piezometric monitoring or modify piezometric monitoring uh, in various areas of <coughs> impoundment. Uh, during, the, during the design document preparation, there was a lot of focus here on this West Ridge because that was a prime focus of the amendment application. But at the same time, we we're investigating the tailings, we we're investigating the embankment. Uh, we did some pretty interesting stuff there where we were drilling, you know, over 700 feet through Rockville, uh, which, you know, as I understand it, is the, is, we have the second deepest hole in Rockville, um, uh, to the knowledge of our drilling contractor. Uh, I think the guy's brother did the deepest and he's got us, he's got us beat by uh, 400 feet or so, so I don't think we're going to get there. Um, since 2015, we've added about 60 new monitoring locations, more than doubled some of the embankment monitoring locations. And, and each year we're out there again, uh, drilling an embankment and installing more, more monitoring infrastructure. Uh, the other really cool thing that's happened is, uh, is, is that last year we implemented a, a, a remote monitoring system, a real state-of-the-art system. Uh, here's a picture of it here. So this is the hole we drilled in the embankment. Uh, there's some, something called the vibrating wire piezometer, but it's just a little electric instrument, I guess, that comes up and monitors pore pressure and it goes to this box. This box is connected to this box, which has two of these little pokey things on the top, which are antennas. If it's got one pokey thing, uh, it's communicating around the site with all the, other, um, with all the other monitoring instruments. And if it's got two, it's attached to a cell signal and it shoots it off and we get it in real time. Um, Montana Resources can log in and, and review what's going on. We're, uh, we're based out of Vancouver. We can log in and review and see what's going on and we can see the trends. And so there's a reading every hour, and every hour it gets it gets bounced up to uh, to the cloud, as we say, um, and we get those readings. Uh, and then that's all powered by the solar panel that sits up there. Um, really, really interesting stuff. Uh, it's all it's all uh, this radio and cellular mesh telemetry, and it, I don't even understand necessarily all the ins and outs of how it works. But they all talk to each other, and they all send, and, and some of them send stuff offsite. And if one that sends stuff offsite goes down, then another one picks up the load. So, really, really interesting. Um, you know, historically, and, and, and really, probably the state of practice still is: you go out, you send a guy out, and his job, probably his sole job, his or her sole job, is to go out and take readings. And he get, downloads the data, goes back. He or she processes it, maybe sends it off. We get it. We spend a bunch of time processing it. Now we literally log in, and the and the numbers there. So pretty pretty interesting stuff. Um, a lot of that that effort is focused around establishing uh, what we'd call an instrumentation section. So there's certain areas along the embankment where we're really <coughs> trying to have a, a bunch of piezometric monitoring sites so we can really see what's going on with with groundwater flow in the embankment. Um, uh, and how, uh, how that changes depending on where we're discharging tailings. Remember, we have nine places we can discharge tailings. So groundwater, what happens with groundwater is going to change depending on where we're discharging tailings. And we've started to see some of those trends over the last couple of years. Um, we also monitor uh, uh, water, as I mentioned, in order to kind of help us understand why, why inventory would go up or down. And, uh, how things are changing over time. Part of that relates to, to the uh, BMFOU requirements, uh, but it also helps us understand uh, the mine water balance um, uh, with Montana resources. Um, as I mentioned, we monitor beach development as well, and this is, this is something that's been refined over, over the past year, and, and we're really, really high on uh, uh, the changes there and what we get out of it. Um, uh, it really helps an understanding of, of scheduling where the, the active tailings discharge location would be in order to bring the whole thing up uh, kind of in, in sequence or at the same time, rather. Um, so on a shiftly basis, the guys, uh, that, uh, the maintenance guys record where tailings is being discharged. So every 12 hours we know which line's been running and for how many hours. And then every week uh, they survey the elevation at these locations. Um, and then uh, every, as well as the elevation of the pond. And then every year we look at, we go, people go out in a boat, they boat around the pond and they take bathymetry and they figure out how much water is in the pond. And every year we use some aerial imagery to, to survey, um, survey the elevations and, the, uh, and what, the, what the, I guess what the um, impoundment is looking like. 
we get all that data, uh, we crunch all that data, look at it, and, and, and try to figure out trends and um, make sure we like the trends. Uh, so, and, so about that crunching of the data, I guess, is uh, all, of that, all of that construction, uh, piezometric monitoring, water monitoring, and pond data gets, gets reviewed um, at least quarterly. And we author a report that kind of summarizes what's been going on over the quarter and any trends that we can discern from the data. Um, and then every year, um, we've taken uh, to a, a habit that isn't required by the legislation. It's just something we deem to be des best practice. And, and we present all of that data that we collect over the course of that year. We author a report. Um, and we, we submit that to the DEQ and to the independent review panel again so that they can see uh, what's going on with the impoundment and um, how things are changing over time and what we've in interpreted those changes to be related to. And then as I mentioned, uh, the independent review panel comes out every year, usually coinciding with most of these reports going out. Uh, and we present them re the results, a short form of the results that says, hey, here's what's been going on in the, over the year. And we explain to them how we're gonna change our practices over the next year and we seek their feedback on that. Where are we gonna drill? Uh, what are we going to do? Um, which again exceeds the, the legislative requirement. You know, the, the legislation requires a, a meeting at least every five years, but we really opted, at least especially in the in the interim here, um, to to set that review schedule and reporting schedule to be be every year. Um, here's actually a little shot of uh, of the crew on site here. We got the independent review panel out there somewhere. I can't see it anymore, but. We had the opportunity this past year, uh, we were doing some of the drilling on the embankment. This is the site that I showed you a few previous slides with all the boxes and gizmos live beaming us the data. This is when we were installing that hole there. So they were out, they got to inspect some of the, the drill core that we were collecting from the embankment and, uh, and talk about the, the drilling process and, and what we were finding. And this is about the, this is the last slide, so I think I'm just going to skate in under the under the mark here. Um, there's also some ongoing initiatives here for to add additional instrumentation. As I as I mentioned, each year we're we're doing a bit more and uh, continuously changing that monitoring program and evolving it. Uh, we're also uh, there are certain aspects of the flow monitoring that we're going to begin to connect to that same uh, automated system, so that the data is just available in, in real time um, uh, to us. I think that's it. This is uh, appreciate the the opportunity to, to talk to you guys here today. Um, and I don't know if anyone has any questions. I'd be happy to answer them. <laughs>